So if I asked to speak to the Buddha within you, that had never been done before. But the moment I say, let me speak to the Buddha within you, and you say, okay, I am the Buddha. I say, okay, then who are you not? Well, I'm not Hale. I'm not the self. I'm not somebody else. I am the Buddha within you. And the moment I say that, I, in a way, skip or transcend the having to become. We know that becoming doesn't work. It's being. Yes. Every time we want to become something, we make effort and we try to become it and it only gets further and further away from us. So if we make that leap from becoming to being, being the Buddha versus trying to become a Buddha, it's night and day difference. And so for years, 2,500 years, even in the Zen tradition, we still tried to become Buddha until finally knocking our head against the wall umpteen times, we finally give up or relinquish and there's the Buddha. Welcome to Letting Go and the Greatest Secret, where we explore the end of your suffering and the beginning of lasting happiness. I'm Hale Dwoskin, and today I'll be joined by Genpo Roshi. Genpo Roshi is one of the earliest pioneers of Zen in the Western world, especially throughout Eastern and Western Europe. He is the creator of Big Mind Zen and has established one of the largest and most successful lineages in the Western world. The Greatest Secret uh, is is a book that talks a lot about awakening and that the key is recognizing that you are not the body-mind, but you are that which is aware of it. And I know that's a core tenant in Buddhism as well. Can you talk about it from your perspective? Yes, and it's actually a very important aspect in our practice of Zen. Uh, and we call it, sometimes we call it dropped off body-mind, uh, shedding body mind, but it's it's discovering the transcendent, discovering that we are one mind, one heart, one body, one spirit, <laughs> and we can go on to say one planet, <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> and one world, and one consciousness, and to discover the oneness. Because once we discover that we're all one, then what naturally arises, of course, is love and compassion for all beings all beings and all things yes uh, even for the planet for even for uh for rocks and and mountains and rivers and oceans for it all and it's all it's all one yes so that's a very important aspect of zen buddhism and it's something that we emphasize and we emphasize the breakthroughs the the awakenings the realizations and of course there are openings and uh, awakenings can be as little as lighting a stick of incense in a dark room to as bright, sunny, beautiful day like it is today, where everything is really clear, or sometimes you just have a glimpse of it. So it's yes, yes. Part of Zen. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and again, the, the key, if, if, in my opinion, and you'll, you'll have to tell, tell me if you agree with this, the key, in my opinion, is to not take any of it too seriously. <laughs> you, just about it. you know, I always tell people, you know, you could take your practice seriously, but don't take yourself so seriously. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think that's where, where a lot of us get stuck. We take we ourselves take, too seriously. Take, you know, and, I and, had, I, go ahead. Well, especially since the self that we're taking seriously isn't actually who we are anyway. It, it's just it's just a projection of our minds. But yeah. and we take that seriously, and that which is exquisitely beautiful and radiantly obvious in this moment, we miss it because we're taking this imaginary self so seriously. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? I do, and, and in fact, one of the things we call that. We call it treasure that lies within, and we have three treasures. Yes. So within us, we wake up to the fact that we're not the fabricated self or the self that we believe we are. We are Buddha, which means all things. Yes. Buddha is awakened to the fact that we are all one. Yes. And then we are Dharma, and that's the manifestation or the teachings of the awakened person or awakened people. 
yes. the, the awakened ones. And then we are the Sangha, that's the community of all of us that are working on waking up in this lifetime. Yes. And, and then those three treasures all lie within and we have to discover them. And um, mm -hmm. it's kind of like living in a home for one's entire life, not realizing that you're living on the greatest uh, vein of gold that has ever been discovered. And you don't discover it until maybe when you do, and it could be too late, uh, just dying or before death, and not yes. too late, it's just late. Yeah. Uh, and what we want to do is wake up to that and enjoy and appreciate this life as the, the awakened one or as the three treasures. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, beautifully put. I, I love that because the the the, the tre learning that the treasure is within exactly. helps you helps you f feel that treasure no matter what's going on outside of you. In That's other right. words, that treasure within doesn't change even if there's challenges in in your life or in. <laughs> uh, there will be. Yeah. Of course, there will. That's the nature of life. Yeah. You know, life is not. It doesn't follow our script. It follows what's it follows what's the natural progression of of the unfolding of karma of karma exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, but we we don't we can't be arbiter saying I want this karma and I don't want that karma. I want this to happen. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. Every time we do that, we suffer. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, absolutely. I wrote a book. My first book was actually on this. I talk a lot about what one of the ancestors said way, way back uh, around 600 AD. And what he said is that if you make a distinction, that distinction separates heaven and hell. So the moment we have a preference for what is over what isn't, <laughs> in other words, we want something other than the way it is, that's the cause of suffering and misery in our life. And so as long as we can work with what is, and in other words, acknowledging it, I don't like the word accepting, embodying it, embracing it, and then working with it, of course, we can make amazing changes. And then there's no one to blame for the way it is. But when we resist it, when we know that resistance breeds more resistance. <laughs> right. right? <When laughs> and it's quite it, futile. <laughs> and it's very futile. That's exactly right. So way back, even 1,500 years ago uh, in Zen, they discovered that having a preference creates suffering. Yes, I, I, I agree 100%. Yeah. If, we're, if, we're, if we're either wanting, anytime we're wanting anything to be different than the way it is, it's an IOU for suffering. That's right. Because it is how it is. Period. Full stop. That doesn't mean you can't, in the next moment, it won't change or you can't work towards bringing about positive changes in your environment or in your right. inner experience. Right, right. But when you allow what is to be as it is, yeah, it, I, I agree with you to not use the word acceptance because often people hear the word acceptance and they think, oh, that means I need to resign myself to exactly. I can't do anything about it. Right, but that's yeah. not what acceptance means. No, acceptance no. is something that happens. It's a natural unfolding that happens inside of you. When you allow it is to be, what comes from that is a feeling of acceptance of what that's is. Right. That's right. But I if you try to embrace. force that, it doesn't work. That's right. I call it embracing. But that's right. Very, very true what you just said. Yes, yes. So, uh, and in the Buddhist teachings or in Zen, mm -hmm. what is it that you, how do you help people get to this, this well, understanding? You know, well, you know, that's been the whole point of Zen is yes. how do you bring about in someone an awakening experience? And it's very difficult. It's very difficult. One of the things that the big mind offers, which, you know, I kind of discovered this process uh, 1999, about 22 years ago. Tell us uh, about that, the, the discovery. Well, okay, so I've been studying Zen since 71. And uh, I'd gone through the whole Zen training, all the koans and became a, what we call an ancestor back in 1980. Uh, 
And then in 1983, I met Hal Stone and uh, I began to study with Hal. He's a Western psychotherapist, uh, originally a Jungian, studied Gestalt and many other forms of psychotherapy. And I, I began to study with him in 83. And I, it was called, the technique was called voice dialogue. And so what is voice dialogue? Just so we, the people okay. don't know what that well, is. Voice dialogue is a Western psychological technique where you give voice to various aspects within you. So like fear. So you oh, give I voice to yes. your fear. Anger. You give voice to yes. your anger. Yes, yes, now yes. the beauty of the voice dialogue and also other techniques that uh, also similar to that, um, you distance yourself from the self yes so that's the beauty so the moment i say okay gempo to myself i'd like to speak to your anger and i say okay i am the voice of anger but i'm no longer gempo right I i'm just only the voice when i say that then I create some distance. Now, the more distance I can create from the self, and this is the basis of, of big mind process, the more distance I can create from the self, the easier it is to let it go, to relinquish it. Yes, yes. Right? Because yeah. everything closer, like my children are very close to me, it's harder to let them go. If it's somebody else's children, they're far away, meaning in a feeling sense, they're far away, then it's easier to let them go than it is yes. my own. So yes, anything yes. I call mine is more difficult. So my understanding is more difficult than your understanding for me to let go of. Right. It's the opposite, right? Right, right. So your notions, your ideas, your beliefs, it's easier for me to let go of yours than it is my own beliefs, <laughs> my own notions, right. and my own understanding. So immediately, the moment we give voice to any aspect, it's easier to let go of the self. So I realized that after using the process from 83 to 99, I realized, wow, I can get in touch with transcendent voices. Yes. So I mentioned earlier uh, the three treasures, the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. So if I asked to speak to the Buddha within you, that had never been done before. Yes. But the moment I say, let me speak to the Buddha within you, and you say, okay, I am the Buddha. I say, okay, then who are you not? Well, I'm not Hale. I'm not the self. You know, I'm not the non-Buddha. I'm not somebody else. I am the Buddha within you. And the moment I say that, I, in a way, skip or transcend the having to become. Right. We know that becoming doesn't work. It's being. Yes. Every time we want to become something, we make effort and we try to become it and it only gets further and further away from us. Uh, absolutely, yes. Right, right. So yes, if yes. we make that leap from becoming to being, being the Buddha versus trying to become a Buddha, it's night and day difference. And so, oh, totally. And so totally. for years, 2,500 years, even in the Zen tradition, we still tried to become Buddha until finally knocking our head against the wall umpteen times, we finally give up or relinquish, and there's the Buddha. Right, it had been there all along. Oh, <laughs> but we relinquish the efforting and the trying, yes, yes. and we discover there it is. So yes, the yes. big mind process, I had discovered this in June of 99, and I saw, oh my God, this is this is rich. This is gold. This is this can really help the world. And so I I named it and I started developing the the big mind process using as my let's say uh, stepping stones voice dialogue and Zen training. So now I have something I call big mind Zen versus let's say Soto Zen or Rinzai Zen or any other form of Zen. The big mind uses the process to help one actualize, first realize and then actualize uh, what it is to be an awakened person. So, yes, yeah. that's beautiful. That's Thank just you. beautiful. And I, I've heard you uh, talk about it. That Do you switch back and forth still? In other words, you'll, you'll talk from the Buddha perspective and then you'll talk from the anger so that people can disassociate from both 
and Correct. and just be the Buddha right, that is behind right. Buddha. Right. Is yeah. that what you do? Absolutely. You want to so, explain that too? Yeah, and I'll explain that. So I've developed over time, it, it didn't happen until about 2005 or six, so about five, six, seven years after the big mind, I discovered what I called the triangle. And what the triangle symbolizes is if you look at a, a triangle, equilateral triangle, where one base is the self, which we know is a fabrication. Yes. And the other corner of the triangle is the transcendent. It could be the Buddha, it could be the Bodhisattva, it could be anything. It could be Jesus Christ, it could be Christ conscious, it could be big mind. Anything on the other side that's transcendent. In other words, goes beyond the dualistic realm. Yes. And then we go to the apex, what I call the apex. And from that perspective, when we look, we embrace both the self and the Buddha. So we don't want to get stuck in the self, but we also don't want to get stuck in identification with the Buddha. Yes. In Zen training, we have gotten stuck there. And because we know that we are not completely living the life of a Buddha or living up to the life of a Buddha, we're constantly trying to become that. Right, and right, there's right. a problem again. Yes, yes. So it just becomes never ending. So we need to disidentify also with the Buddha, and I call it the unnameable. So the yes. apex is forever unnameable. So yes, it's called yes. the apex. Right, I don't right, give right. it a name. Like in voice dialogue, we call that the aware ego. Yes. But it's still naming it. Yes, so yes. So I like to call it just the unnameable. Yes. or the, the actualized self, or the actualized uh, human being. Yes, yes. Uh, Self-actualized human being. Yes. Uh, where we don't give ourselves a new identity and a new thing to get stuck on. Yes, well, and that's so easy for the mind to do. The mind, the mind is like a flypaper. <laughs> exactly. it, it's always looking for something. It's, for, something it's either to looking to stick to something or yeah. trying to get something to stick to it. Exactly. Uh, but what's interesting, I love what you're describing, because it, it also mirrors a technique that we teach, uh, several of them, but one of them is we call it holistic releasing, uh -huh. where you embrace, you embrace the apparent problem, and then you embrace its transcendence. Yeah. And you go back yeah. and forth between the two, and they, they, they dissolve each other, and what you're left with is just the pure awareness that has no name. That has no name. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, you know, this is a time, I think, where many of us are, in a way, discovering something beyond the traditional, something that we in the West are offering uh, the process. Yeah, that's, a, I think that's a key piece. You know, there's, we're, we're so fortunate to have all the wisdom traditions, both the Eastern and the Western wisdom traditions, Zen and, uh, uh, Advaita Vedanta and and there's so many and also from the east the the mystic Christians and and the kind of in between there's uh, Sufism there's many many rich beautiful um, traditions and I I know I'm leaving many out uh, and of course Buddhism the whole the whole Buddhist tradition, there's so many aspects of it that are just exquisitely beautiful. But what's what's wonderful about the time period we're living in is that we're they're all getting exposed to each other in this neutral place where this alchemy can happen. And we as this generation are are finding ways a synthesis. I didn't say that correctly. Right. We're, we're finding a way where they, we, we're looking to where they're all pointing instead of looking at the pointers. And when we do that, then it enriches whatever tradition we're from. Yet at the same time, we can transcend tradition and just be that pure emptiness or awareness or beingness or isness that has no name and has no form. Would you agree with that? I, I do, I do. And I think it's important that we realize not to give it a label. Yes. Because the moment we give it a name, we give it a label, in that moment, we identify with that and then we grab it. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
you know, so yes. it's very important. I also feel that, you know, when I started this 50 years ago, and, and I don't know when you started, but when I started this whole process, it was East meeting West. Yes. And that happened. And I kept saying, but what about the South, Southern Hemisphere? And I think we're now in a time where the Southern Hemisphere and the traditions are also coming into play and giving us even a, a kind of more expanded view of how to get to the place that we're all going. Yes, yes. <laughs> or back yes. to where we are. <laughs> right, right. That, I mean, it's so funny uh, that, uh, again, one of the things that happens, uh, again, I'm from the tradition I'm from is a very new tradition that uh, Wester Levinson, my teacher, was a fully realized teacher, but he had no, he was free of tradition. Uh, he wasn't from a particular lineage. Right. And I'm, I guess I, I, right now I'm the lineage holder for his tradition uh, because he passed it all on to me and asked me to continue it. And at first I tried to do it his way and his way was still about becoming. And then what happened is it started in the 90s, if not before then, I started realizing it's not about becoming, it's about what already is. And if you work from what already is, the becoming drops away and it gets effortless and beautiful. Right. And yeah, so, I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you I was just going to say, Suzuki Roshi coined a beautiful phrase. You effort towards effortlessness. Yes, yes. <laughs> right? It drops no. away, like you just said. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you feel like you need to make an effort, make an effort. But what you what you discover at some point is that being what you actually are is the most effortless thing possible. And it's not even a thing. It's just being. It's just effortless. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just being. Yeah. Very, exactly. Very clear. Exactly. So do you have things that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, any pointers? practical point is well practical from the sense of something they can do to explore this for themselves yeah you know one of the things one can do is just practice voices on your own and i i have several ways that i recommend doing that no please share them yeah for me so in 99 after so many years of meditation and concentration practices and koan study and all that, I found that I could actually do the voices on my own as I'm meditating. So mm -hmm. advanced practitioners can do it that way. You can actually ask to speak, let's say, may I speak to your big mind, for example. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, I'm big mind. Okay, so what are you not? Well, I'm not Gempo. <laughs> He's certainly yeah. not a big mind. <laughs> He's a else uh i'm not the self uh i'm not his anger i'm not his this i'm not his that i'm just big mind okay so how big are you well i look in oh, i can't find any limit right all right i'm limitless well what color are you i can't find a color as i look in well what shape are you i can't find a shape so in a way I can say I'm colorless, I'm shapeless, I'm limitless. Okay, then who are you? Well, I'm me, <laughs> you know, it's me, it's this, it's this body. This body, this very body is limitless. This very body is the Buddha. This very body is the Bodhisattva. This very body is Christ consciousness. This very yes. body is the whole. And then using that technique, I can do it in my sitting. Now, of course, there's further to go using the triangle and you change voices yes, and you go yes, back yes. to the other corner and all that. That's it more advanced. But I'm just saying how it could be used for beginners if they have some concentration. If they don't have the ability to sit there and do that, then they can write it. Or they ah, can yes, work a with good others. suggestion. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. They can yes. write it out. Okay, so you ask yourself to speak and then you write as the one speaking. Yeah. But also you can use others and that's where our you know, big mind organization comes in. We connect people to use it with each other. So we're actually uh, facilitating one another and we trade off. And it's uh -huh. a wonderful thing to do with your partner. You know, my, my partner and I, you met her, Charlotte. Yeah. You know, we did a lot of this work and we still do 
especially coming into our, our connection, you know, a lot of work where we facilitated one another. And you actually can become more intimate that way than many other ways, because you start to know the intimate parts of each other as well as oneself. Yes. And the intimate aspects. And so your vulnerability is more present. You learn how to be more vulnerable, more open, more receptive. You learn how to disidentify with certain things that you might label as that's who I am. That's what I am. No, not necessarily. That's what I'm conditioned to be. Yes. That's yes. not who I am. Right. And so it really helps in relationship. Uh, I feel like we have a very, very uh, mature and healthy relationship. And I'm happy to say that because I'm not one that has emphasized relationships in my life. Uh, being in Zen and in a monastery for 40 years, I didn't work on relationships much. <laughs> I yes. had to go to the Western psychotherapy, like voice dialogue to help me. And my wife happens to be a therapist. So she helps me a lot in the relational because yes. the Zen is more transcendent and less relational. non -relational. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and, I, and I, yeah, I did just meet your wife and yeah, which I'm thrilled about because I could tell just from seeing the two of you <laughs> together that there, you have a wonderful relationship. We're There's doing, this, yeah. this beauty and this openness and the simpleness. And it was Thank very you. fun to watch. Yeah. <laughs> it really was. It was, it's beautiful. She was trying to, just for the audience, she was trying to help me out with the technical. Right. So well, bumbling. all three of us were bumbling through. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's well, at least we can laugh about it <laughs> yeah i know and that's important i mean that's just as such that in itself is such a simple teaching if yeah. you if you can't laugh about it if you if you're if you're taking it seriously you're giving too much power to to that which isn't real it's just a source of suffering so yeah. it's so true and everything's that way yes <laughs> don't, sweat, don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. it's all small stuff that's right <laughs> and we forget yeah of course yeah of course we forget yeah. it's interesting that you said about it's i love that you have the three ways you can either do it with yourself you can uh dialogue with yourself using paper because and, and or you can do it with a partner and we find the same thing is true with releasing when you can do it with yourself and it's very powerful but sometimes it's very helpful to just take out a piece of paper and write it down mm -hmm. so you become more objective to it you're and and it's beautiful it, there's such a, a sweetness that happens when two people are facilitating each other in letting go just like i'm sure when they're facilitating each other in big mind because whatever you feel like you're however you feel like you're helping them you're always helping yourself more Absolutely. without realizing it because there's just this you have to get out of your own way in order to be there for the other person and that's an, an exquisite part of of both of our traditions which is beautiful yeah now i want to say something to this so it's beautiful to me that you and I both have approached the whole awakening consciousness process in very different ways, yes. in very different teachings and very yes. different perspectives. You could say like we're climbing a mountain and we started on different ends. That's different right. That's right. Mountain, With different right? gear. With different gear. <laughs> and yet we come to the same realizations, the same understandings, everything you say, I can go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, same thing <laughs> on this end, yes, right. yes. <laughs> and yet we've taken very different paths and we're still yeah. on very different paths. Yes. And yet it's one. Yes. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Yes. And everyone listening, whatever your path is, as long as it's you're following your heart, just know that, and you're earnest, you, you, you'll discover the same things for yourself. Gempo and I are not unique. <laughs> that's right. And we're all uh, coming home. We're that's coming right. Home. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. We, we truly are. Yeah. Truly are. We're all coming home. Yes. So is there anything um, you'd like to leave people with as something to explore? Uh, now, I know you gave people a suggestion about exploring Big Mind, yeah. which sounds wonderful. Uh, is there anything else that you might... Well, I truly believe in meditation, obviously. Yes. And I have over the years, in, in a way you can say, kind of uh, simplified it, Good. And made it more accessible 
for people universally. When I started back in 71, uh, you know, we sat full Lotus or half Lotus, or we couldn't do full Lotus. We sat for 10, 12 hours a, a day, sometimes seven days, sometimes more. I did once three months of sitting 12 hours a day <laughs> with a group of 30 people. You yeah. know, and, and it was a kind of samurai approach to spirituality, yes, definitely. right? And we used the Kiyosaku, which is the awakening stick where we oh, wow, wake yes. up, you know. Hey, and, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> What I've done in the last 10 years, I feel, is kind of refine what it is to meditate. And it, it just really a process of relaxation, ah, but with the, with the back upright. So yes. I, I sit in a chair these days and I sit with my back upright like this, but very relaxed. And the more that I can relax, the more I can let go. Yes. The more I can let go, the more I relax. Yes, yes. And it becomes a positive vicious cycle. I don't yes. think the word vicious is right, but right, but it, it, a re self reinforcing. Self reinforcing. <laughs> yes. So that the more I can let go and in a way shed my whatever I'm identified with and become one with my breathing and just relax into the breath and take some deep breaths in the beginning and then learn to just regulate the breath so you're very relaxed. And I don't emphasize full lotus. I don't emphasize a, a deep concentration. It's just being one with the breath. And you can actually ask to speak to the breath. So if mm -hmm. I say, okay, let me speak to the breath as I'm meditating. Okay, I am the breath. What am I doing? Okay, as the breath, I'm breathing in. And I'm breathing out. And I'm not Gempo. I'm not the meditator. I'm not one meditating, I'm just the breath. And I just breathe and I relax and I shed everything, and let it all go. And you get into such a deep samadhi that in a way that's self-perpetuating too. Yes. Because the deeper the samadhi, of course, the more you're drawn in, the yes. more you're kind of invited in, the deeper you go and the more you don't want to stop. Yes. And so meditation doesn't become or is not no longer an effort it's effortless yes right as we talked about before but it's also you reach a state of total peace and tranquility and serenity and equanimity uh and it's complete freedom yes. and it's so simple yes and so what i work with with people and they can try it on their own is not trying to make it more complicated or difficult than it yes. really is yes, yes and just to stay really simple and they could try that 10 minutes a day eventually maybe 30 minutes a day eventually once you get into it you don't want to stop you might sit i, I sit usually a few hours every night yes about four hours every night yes that's wonderful yeah i love it and it doesn't interfere with my day because i do it at night Yes. I still try to get about five hours sleep, but you know, the sitting really makes up for a lot of the sleep. Oh yeah, it definitely does. Yeah. It definitely does. Yeah. 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 I, I, uh, uh, I think that's beautiful sitting up and doing that. Just basically you just, you're sitting back into that, which you are. Exactly. Isn't that what you're doing? Exactly. You're just settling down into who you are. Right. That's what I mean by returning home. Yes. Coming yes. Back to your true nature. Yes, yes. The true self, yeah. That's it, beautiful. It, it's, it's very delicious. I mean, it, I, I sometimes I call it silk samadhi. Silk samadhi. Because you feel the silkiness. Yes, it's all, yes. It's all so, it, it, it's very, it's, my teacher used to say it's more delicious than a fresh river <laughs> when you're really thirsty. <laughs> right, it's right, right. It's that delicious. Yes, you know? yes, yes. It's, it's something, yeah. And yes, it, you, I, just, it, you just want to sit more. And the more you sit, the more you stop identifying with the self or the conditioned self, the one that is picking and choosing. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and I'm sure you notice that it, it, both for you and the people you work with, the more you do that, the more it carries over into your, Absolutely. into everything else. Yeah, exactly. I'm glad you mentioned that, yeah. I take that for granted. That people right, right. But again, we're, we have yeah. an audience that some people will take that for granted, but I wanted others, to point that out to everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. That's right. It, it, it begins to manifest in your daily life more and more. And yeah. at some point, you don't 
even remember what it used to be like. <laughs> right. Exactly. You, know, you don't. I work a lot with people now on eliminating internal conflict, the uh -huh. inner conflict, because once we eliminate the inner conflict between what we want and what we have, <laughs> we right. earlier, once we eliminate that conflict, then we're really at peace all yes. the time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because that conflict is gone. We don't have that dialogue between ourselves and hunger. Right, right. <laughs> this right. is what you should do. No, this is what I want to do. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. It's just beautiful. Fun. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Genpo Roshi. You can learn more about Genpo at bigmind.org. That's B I G M I N D. Dot org. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you have immediate access to future episodes. Please give us a five-star rating and share it with the people you care about. If you'd like to learn more about my work, my mentor Lester Levinson's work, and the Sedona Method, please visit www.sedona.com. As you explore our site, you'll learn the key to lasting happiness, success, peace, and emotional well-being. We have books, courses, events, and plenty of free material to explore. Again, go to Sedona.com. That's S-E-D-O-N-A dot com. Thank you for being here. And we'll catch you on the next episode of Wedding Go and the Greatest Secret.